extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube. Covering VMworld 2015. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem sponsors. Now your host, Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are live in San Francisco, Moscone North. Stop by the lobby. It's not quite as busy without the keynotes as it's been the last couple of days, but we're excited for day three wall-to-wall -wall coverage from VMworld 2015. Joined in my deck segment by uh, George Gilbert from Wikibon. George, good to see you. And Bob Muglia, CEO of Softlake Computing. Welcome. Snowflake. Snowflake, I'm <laughs> sorry. Snowflake Computing, it's live TV. And I grew up probably more than anybody. So welcome, Bob. Glad to be here. So for people that aren't familiar with Snowflake, why don't you give them kind of the quick overview of sure. what you guys are up to? We're a cloud data warehouse company. We were founded about three years ago. We built a complete SQL relational data, database data warehouse from scratch. So it's it's all new database code. We don't use any, any pre-existing uh, things like Hadoop or, or Postgres or anything like that in creating. It's an all new system. It was designed for the cloud and it's an incredible data warehouse. I think it's really like, it's one of the best products I've ever experienced and uh, it's solving a lot of problems for our customers. And then where are you kind of in the life of the company in terms of, you're obviously GA, how many right, people, kind right. of funding, give us kind of that info. We, 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 we completed our Series C funding, okay. uh, which was, was earlier this year, that we, 45 million, we've raised a total of 76 million. Oh, about 85 people in the company, as I said, three years old. The company was founded by uh, th the three founders, all architects, two, Oracle data warehouse architects that that uh, had been in, in the data warehousing group for a long time, and um, and and then the third founder is a performance expert. So, so Bob, you have a rather illustrious uh, background. Why don't you tell us a little about sort of your your uh, history and what brought you back to the startup world? Sure, thanks, George. So, yeah, the thing that, for me is I spent 23 years at Microsoft. I was the first technical guy on SQL Server back in 1988. Uh, when it was the Ashton Tate Microsoft SQL Server on OS2, if anyone can remember that. And then I had the, the, the good fortune to work and run product teams within Microsoft for, for that 23 years. So I was, for the last eight years, seven years at Microsoft, I was the president of the Server and Tools Group. Uh, so I ran Windows Server, SQL Server, Visual Studio, all of our management and security products. And, mm -hmm. and then I left there, I spent a couple of years at Juniper, and decided I really wanted to focus on building things. And what I saw looking at the big tech industries is a lot of big tech companies that have you know, strong legacy businesses, but they're not doing the innovation, and all the innovation was happening in small companies. So I sought out a small company that was doing something really unique and different, and, and Snowflake was a perfect fit. So, um Continuing on that on that theme, um, <laughs> Snowflake Snowflake as a cloud database. Yeah. What distinguishes a, a, a cloud database from packaged software? Well, it's interesting. I mean, there's different kinds of there's different kinds of cloud solutions. People think of information as a service, platform as a service, and then software as a service. We're a software as a service, so we're fully turnkey, like Salesforce. You load data, you run queries. There's no administration, no DBA to work work to do. There's no indices to create. There's there's no you know there's no uh, uh, keys that need to be built to do distribution across different nodes. We handle all of that for the customer, and that's pretty different than other cloud data warehouses. And it's certainly very different than getting an appliance, a data warehouse appliance, or a software that's installed in a set of machines within a data center, where really those tasks are taken on by the IT department. So okay, let's talk about first Oracle, which. You know, it's there because it's it's, it's there. It's there. <laughs> um, they want to put it on their cloud now, but right. it's still at its you know heart. It's a packaged product. Right. So um, whether they manage it or or whether the user manages it, perhaps Oracle has you know more sophistication to bring to bear. Um, all those activities you just mentioned, all those administrative tasks, right. still need to be done. Well, it depends, right? With Oracle, okay. they absolutely still need to be done. Yeah. And in fact, you know, our founders, uh, Benoit Degaville in particular, worked on Oracle management on Exadata. That was his you know, function was to help make Oracle easier to use. Right. And he found it to be a relatively fruitless and hopeless task. <laughs> and, and so what wound up hap winds up happening is while you can make it a bit easier, you still a lot of work to do because of the inherent architecture of Oracle. And when Oracle talks cloud, they always mean managed services. I mean, that's really what they're saying when they talk about 
Oracle cloud products. Snowflake is totally different. We were designed um, from the ground up to be a full scale out SaaS service to support thousands and thousands of customers simultaneously with effectively no management tasks. All of that tuning and all the different knobs and dials to be set, that's all replaced with architecture that's designed to not require those settings to be done. So let me move from Oracle to something a little sort of further towards the service spectrum, but right. maybe not all the way with the uh, scalability. Um, um, Microsoft SQL Azure. Azure, you know, data services. I, I heard, um, I think at past summit last year, they have like a million five instances you know, last year. Of and, SQL Server. Yeah, of SQL Server. Right, very successful product. I yes. Love, I, I mean, I, I have some affinity to SQL Server That's since good. I was there at the very beginning. So, um, you know, if you had sort of uh, DBA managing 50 databases, you'd still need 30,000 DBAs there. Right. So they must have done a fair amount of automation. You know, they've done some for sure, and they will make it a bit easier to run in the cloud environment, but most of the administrative tasks that are present in SQL Server will still be present in SQL Azure Data Warehouse. And so you'll still need a DBA. Just like with Redshift, you still need a DBA. The okay. existing products were all built, you know, if you look at, at competitive cloud technologies other than Snowflake in the data warehousing space, they're all, existing package products that have been picked up and put into the cloud. And so the fundamental characteristics may make the same. If you, if you look, I mean, sure, Microsoft or Amazon will provision the instances for you. That's great. Um, and that helps for sure. You don't have to wheel in a new piece of hardware. But then from that point on, there's a lot of management tasks associated with that. Let's then key in on, on Redshift. Because um, John Furrier had, uh, uh, I think, dinner with Andy Jassy uh -huh. a couple weeks ago. And, he singled out Redshift as sort of on fire, and we've heard that from, you know, our startup contacts in, in the in the valley. Um, we know that technology came partly from you know Parkcell, Par Excel. and uh, and then they you know built a lot on it. What still is exposed in terms of administrative knobs that like? Basically all of them. Really? I mean, so I mean, okay. what, what, they, what Amazon did is, is they acquired rights to Par Excel and they, they hosted it in the AWS cloud environment. And they've done a very good job of doing that. So it's super easy in Amazon to instantiate a new Redshift cluster. But that's kind of where it ends. I mean, they help you back it up. There's a few things they do. But all of the administrative tasks you have to do, you still have to vacuum it, you still have to manage it, you still have to determine your distribution keys. All of the things that you had to do with Par Excel, or really with any shared nothing database, you have to do with Redshift. And you know that's one of the big differentiators that Snowflake has, is that all of those tasks don't exist. Um, we don't use a traditional architecture like shared disk or shared nothing. In fact, we have a new architecture that has never been existed before that we call multi-cluster shared data that essentially makes this administrative work go away and provides us with an incredible degree of elasticity and almost limitless scalability. Okay, so let's, let's try and quantify that. Um, whether it's in DBAs or databases per DBA that like Redshift requires right. or, or Azure SQL database services or, right. you know, and Snowflake, or just dollars per terabyte so, for running costs. So it's, I mean, it's, 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 you take whatever it is for on-premise and you say, okay, it's almost the same in the cloud, except you don't need to have the person ordering the hardware and installing the hardware and connecting wires. That's helpful, okay. right? But, but the administrative tasks for Azure, SQL Azure Data Warehouse or for, or for Redshift or for other products, certainly things like Hadoop, God forbid, um, are, are essentially the same in a cloud environment as they are in an on-premise environment. So that's those comparisons. In Snowflake, you don't need a DBA. So the, the equation is divide by zero. There's no need to have a DBA in but Snowflake. But is there, just so we can get a sense of the metrics, I, I understand it's, you can say zero for, for Snowflake, but sort of how would you measure the running cost? You know, in, right. in DBAs per, per terabyte, DBAs per database, you know, or, or just... Operational cost, the yes. all, total cost of ownership. Yes. Well, I mean, the first thing about all of these products is, is what does it cost to acquire the system, right? There's the hardware cost, there's a the software cost, maybe it's packages and appliance. And if you look at traditional enterprise data warehouses that exist on-premise, um, so whether it's Oracle or Teradata or Natiza, you get down the list, 
those things are expensive. They are just really expensive. So comparing them to a cloud solution, it's almost an unfair comparison. It really is, because it's the cost that the customer will bear is a fraction of what they would pay for the software and hardware alone, let alone the administrative cost. And then there's further savings, as I said, from an administrative perspective. Can you, can you help us quantify? I know I'm, I'm repeating myself. I'm just, I want to well, get something. Let me give something you an example. That, let me give yeah. you an example. We have had customers come to us that, that have Oracle maintenance, Oracle, Oracle systems that are approaching the end of their, their, their useful life and they've had, you know, Oracle has quoted them like a $6 million replacement cost. And their annual maintenance on that is north of a million dollars, right? Because the God-given 22% maintenance cost that, that Larry charges all customers, um, one of Larry's rules. Uh, so if you look at that, you could get the same level of performance for, for Snowflake, in fact, better performance on Snowflake for that installation on an annual basis for well under half a million dollars a all year. In. All Oper in, all operational in. And costs. That, and that doesn't, okay. you know, and, and that's, you know, of course the Oracle system, you're not talking about power, you're not talking about data center costs, you're not talking about operational costs. So you add all of that up, I mean, you're talking about a lifetime, a lifetime cost over a five or six year system of 10, 12, you know, at least million dollars. We would be able to solve that customer problem all in, upside down, for well under, you know, well under two and a half million dollars. Okay. And it'd be, it, it would be, so often it's a quarter or even less. And, and I'm being conservative, I want to be clear, I'm being conservative in these right. numbers. So, the actual numbers are probably better. So that's a good transition kind of the, to the business of, of, of what you guys are uh, doing. So how much of your business is, is because you've got this special cloud native system ready to go for right. new apps, and then there's always a debate about kind of rip and replace versus sure. what, you know, what's already up and running, we don't want to touch it, migrate it to the cloud, and eh, maybe, maybe not, versus native, of course, we'll put it there. But it sounds like you're getting some activity in people actually swapping out legacy and moving on. We are, we're in, in fact, I have a call this afternoon with one of our customers that, that is doing an Oracle migration, a large Exadata migration, and we're in the process of actually implementing that solution for the customer. The, you know, the, we, see, we see several things. I mean, our, our sort of initial customer base came from from people that had had data already in the cloud and were familiar with the cloud so often tech companies advertising media gaming companies that already were big users of the cloud you know we're now seeing a broader and broader set of customers that are more traditional enterprises evaluate the cloud and, and I'm talking about public cloud situation right, here, right? right so so SaaS services like Snowflake. And the reality is almost all of these large companies have begun to adopt some SaaS services, right. whether it's for their CRM applications with Salesforce or whether it's email. They're moving down the path of bringing SaaS into their environment. Now obviously, you know, if, you have a, a, if you're a major enterprise with thousands of business applications, you're not going to change overnight to the cloud, and so you're going to be operating in some form of hybrid environment for some period of time. Right. But the migration and the acceptance of the cloud as a part of the overall IT solution is becoming much more commonplace. Right. And I think one of the big things we've seen is that if you went back 12 months ago, and you talked to companies that were in the financial services industry or the healthcare industry, you know, they would go, no way to the cloud. We're, you know, we're not ready for that. And now what we're seeing is companies that are in the, these, even these companies that are in highly regulated industries being in a situation where they are putting in place policies, security policies and procedures to allow them to appropriately adopt cloud systems that take into account their security and regulatory needs. So they're and laying the foundation then to really right. start to make that move, at least in a limited way, or find the places where they can exactly. make that move. And we find that great engagement with companies. We're having you know, good conversations with both financial services and healthcare companies right now on that. And, and as an example, we're in the process of HIPAA certification for what we're doing with Snowflake. And that's a crucial thing to achieve in order to, to enable right. many of these healthcare companies right. to work with, right. with a cloud data warehouse. So so the other thing we talk quite a bit is you know, horses for courses. It's all driven by the workload, it's all right. driven by the workload, where you put what's all driven by the workload. So are there any particular workflows that um, Snowflake is really a, a better solution than yeah, the other that, that kind of stand out? Absolutely, so you know, when we built this thing, when, when, when the engineers built this fully relational SQL, and by the way, it's full SQL, not this partial SQL. We run, if you're familiar with SQL benchmarks, there's something called C C uh, TPCDS, which is not a great benchmark, but it's a great test of the thoroughness of the analytical SQL capabilities that a data warehouse provides. And we run the whole thing, and many existing data warehouses don't do that. 
But the workload that, that is most interesting and where Snowflake is really highly differentiated is for customers who have some form of machine-generated data, be it, be it from web applications or cloud apps or mobile devices or sensors. And this data tends to take the form of, 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 of what we call semi-structured data, and it comes in, in typically packaged in JSON or Avro format, sometimes XML. And Snowflake just is awesome at that. I mean, if you look compared to almost anything else in the market, customers that are trying to work with this data are in misery. I mean, they're, they're practically crying at their desks. It's so difficult to actually get answers out of this data using traditional solutions like Hadoop, which just don't perform very well and are very hard. And with Snowflake, it's, it's incredibly easy. You just load the data and you run queries and we were able to give them the answers almost instantly. So, uh, just along those lines, because I read the, the JSON or semi-structured database white paper, yeah. uh, or data support white paper, um, and others on paper have you know this sort yeah, of schema paper. on need, schema on, on read sort of yeah, thing. The, what, what's your secret sauce that makes this possible? Because I know, love that question, Drew. Thanks for okay. that question. So, so the the you know other people can read in data and then just throw brute CPU horsepower at it to go through and find the answers. And sure, they can scan it. And if you take a Hadoop system and you use Hive or you use Impala or you're something, like that, that's what you're doing, right? You can run a query against, against that and you're just throwing the brute horsepower of the cluster at it. And someday you'll get an answer. I mean, the answers will come out, but it is not a very very performant thing. And then meanwhile, you're dealing with the administrative costs of that solution, which by the way, are even worse than the administrative costs of a traditional data warehouse. Um, in, with Snowflake, what we do is, is we are schemaless in our design, just like that. But unlike those solutions, when, when you load data into Snowflake, we have a special, a special data type we call a variant data type. And when, when data gets loaded into variant, what happens is we discern the schema of the, of the JSON file. So if you look at JSON or Avro, it is organized as a hierarchy with, with, with different levels within that hierarchy providing different data elements. Now while it is schemaless, and in fact the schema evolves dynamically, it changes over time. So unlike structured data, which is a fixed schema, this changes. Um, there, is, there is some commonality to the schema. It repeats, you know, that you tend to have attributes that repeat. Well we actually discern that, and then we, um, we we use our same columnar compression that would be used in a modern modern data warehouse, and we apply that to the um, to this uh, this semi-structured data, and then we use our full query processor with pruning to be able to just select exactly the data you need. So you can perform a full relational query using the full rich semantics of SQL against this semi-structured data with performance almost as fast as structured. Would it be fair to say then that you're doing the work? while the data is being ingested to add enough structure so that when you want to get it out at query time, you've had it structured enough where the, the elements that are in common, you can scan we through very quickly. That's a good way to put it. We essentially discern the structure that exists within that at the time the data is loaded. And, it, and we don't have to require, there's no pre-declaration of this required. You just load the data and we intuit it as the data is loaded. And then we, we actually store metadata associated with that. So we compress the data. And, and, and so you have very low amounts of data that you have to, small amounts of data that you have to scan. And then we discern um, the, the, the key attributes of that data and we get statistics from that so that our query optimizer can, can just issue, you know, issue a query, uh, so it's results that are fast. So, so like we have a customer, we have one of our customers that has a, 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 a single table that approaches 200 terabytes in size and that's compressed. Uncompressed it would be somewhere between one and two petabytes in size. And, and, and with that customer, I mean if you scan 100, you know, 150 terabytes, you know, if you have to scan it all like you would do with Hadoop, it's going to take a while, even with modern, modern horsepower. But, but for, what these folks are able to do is the vast majority of their queries are what's happened in this period of time with these conditions. They set a set of predicates on it. And so instead of the result taking hours to happen, it can happen in minutes or even seconds. Okay. So it's literally orders of magnitude faster than the alternative so approach. So this is a lead in and sort of to the, we're running out of time with the last question, which is, so you have a, a product um, sort of data warehouse as a service, and we've talked uh, before about how Azure 
Google Cloud Platform right. um, and Amazon have multiple data management right. products. They're calling a data platform, but they're still pretty discreet. When those start to come together, if they start to come together, are you essentially positioning um, Snowflake as you know, already multi-model in the sense that it... It already is multi-model. Okay. And I don't know whether they ever will come together, to be honest, because those are all built as discrete technologies with clear architectural foundations underneath them. And you just can't take, you know, you can't take an apple, an orange, and, you know, and make a pear out of it. It's, it's a, it's, it, they're different fruit. Almost and like the organizational, the R&D organizational barriers or boundaries show up in the product boundaries. The, the organizational do and the product lineage. Now, I mean, all of these products, I mean, whether you're talking about SQL Server, whether you're talking about Redshift with Par Excel. I mean, all of these products have lineages that go back 20, 30 years into code bases that were, you know, that, that were designed, frankly, in the 1980s, right? SQL Server, I said 1988. A lot of that code's still in the product. And, and if, you, if you look, you can't just snap your fingers and change that. So the, the crazy thing is, is that, is that our founders had the guts and the ability to actually take and build the first and only these days modern cloud data warehouse that was built from scratch to solve the problem that today's customers have. And those, those problems include, sure, a fully functional, structured, relational data warehouse that's super competitive against Oracle and Ter Teradata on one hand, but also a, a product that at the same time seamlessly solves the problem for customers that are working with machine-generated data and you know, essentially blows the socks off of alternative solutions like Hadoop. All right, okay. Bob, we're, we're out of time, that was a great wrap anyway, I was going to ask you for the last word, I think you got it in. It's a great, I mean, the last word is we love our product. That's there you the go, last That's word. Possible. Thanks for stopping by. Bob Muglia, Snowflake Computing, check it out. Uh, I'm Jeff Frick with George Gilbert. We're at VMworld 2015, you're watching theCUBE. We'll be back with our next guest after this short break. Oh.